uh, those are gonna, who are going to be joining us uh, through the week. Uh, just want to keep, keep you informed of some things that are going to be happening. Uh, this morning, uh, we want to continue to pray for the churches of Rocky Mountain House uh, because there's a lot of things that are going on in the churches and the different struggles that are happening. Um, last night, Amy and I went to watch the, uh, the pageant uh, that the Emmanuel Lutheran are doing online. Not online, uh, at drive-in. And so it was kind of different. I haven't done that before, but it was good. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the drive-in theaters, but it was, it, was still, it was still a good opportunity. And so we just want to continue to pray. So if you haven't seen it, it's tonight at 5, 6, and it's 7. And you have to come into the home hardware parking lot from the west side, so you turn right into it. So just so that you know, so from at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and it's 7 o'clock, you get there about 15 minutes ahead of time. Because if you get there too soon, then um, they won't let you in anyway. So just, just make sure you know that. Um, just for a couple of their other announcements, uh, we are starting on, and here it is, January 2021. Can you imagine that we're doing announcements for 2021? Starting on the 4th of January, from the 4th to the 8th, and then again on the 11th to the 15th, I'm going to be doing a morning devotion and this devotion is going to be on resolutions. And I'm, I'm excited about it because it's talking about how we are to live our lives as a witness in our everyday life and to get us to start to think about living this way. And so starting on the 4th, if you go online, it's going to be live. If you want to watch it later on that day, do it later on that day. But uh, every morning, we're going to be doing it for 10 days. So that just kind of gives you just a heads up coming up. Also, Wednesday, this Wednesday, Mickey and the girls are going to be doing it live online. Uh, they're going to be doing Christmas, Christmas songs. Uh, I, have under, I do have it on, on uh, good authority that there's going to be one special song. And I'm not sure if it's the one that I'm thinking. If it is, um, we are going to have words. But <laughs> we've got to watch that. Well, I'm going to watch it anyways. But uh, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And what a great opportunity just to, to uh, sing some Christmas songs. It gives you some, something more than just sitting at home. Um, and then, unless you have, a, yeah, unless you don't have online. And then on Friday, starting at 6 o'clock, there is a group of people, there's four, four uh, group, four vehicles that are going to be going around the southern part of, of Rocky. And then on Saturday night, is going to be on the northern part, starting at seven or at six. So uh, just keep following that along as well. Now, uh, Monday morning at eleven o'clock, uh, if you are going to be watching, we're going to have the memorial for Cyrus Smith. And uh, there's going to be, unfortunately, only ten people allowed. But you know what? We are going to take a time just to remember Cyrus. Uh, and all that he was and all that he did. And uh, there's a few, mo few tributes that have already been brought in that are really very, very good. And then Saturday at 2 o'clock, there's going to be a memorial for Rudy. And it's going to be on YouTube. And so once YouTube kicks in, uh, we are going to be sending out the link to the YouTube Live to everybody in the church. So keep an eye out for that and then to the other different organizations. If you think of someone, send it forward to them as well, just so that everybody's able to connect. Now, prayer requests. Uh, we've been asked to pray for Jim. He's going to be going in for surgery come Wednesday. Jim Neese on, on Wednesday. So um, I just keep thinking everybody knows who Jim is. but um, So on Wednesday, he's going to be going in for surgery, so we want to pray for him and the family as well. All right? Is there any other prayer needs that we need to be praying for this morning? No? Well, let's... Uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray for the churches uh, this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you, Father, that you are faithful, and that even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of this lockdown, as it, as it feels like, and we, we hold back, God, in the midst of this, you are still God. 
you're still on the throne and we just acknowledge you. God, when we feel like we don't have freedom, we still are free because of Jesus. And Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on that. Father, this morning, we want to pray for the churches of Rocky Mountain House. That, Father, that you would help each one as they maneuver through this time. That, Father, that your presence would come and fill each church. Lord, as the, as, well, actually fill the buildings, even as the church gathers together. Lord, there you are because you dwell in each one. And I pray, Father, that as, as worship rises in every building, that, Father, that your presence would so saturate. And that, Father, understanding that this, this worship starts from our hearts. God, I pray that we would just turn our hearts towards you in acknowledging you. Father, it can't start from our heads. It comes from a heart of desire and brokenness and love for you. Father, we pray, Lord, that your name would continue to reach out into our community in these ways, Lord, through the online and, and all these other ways. And Father, again, I just want to pray for Emmanuel Lutheran as they continue to put the pageant uh, as a drive-in. Father, I pray that you would have, you would use that to effectively reach people. And that, Father, tonight, Lord, that they would start to look to you and see you as the answer that they need. Father, today we also want to lift up Jim. And we ask you, Father, that you would prepare him for this surgery. That God, that you would give him strength. Father, in the place where he's weak, Father, you are almighty God. And I pray, Father, that today he might experience your strength and your peace. Bless them today. And Father, for those who are online, where there's needs and there's things that are going on, Father, we pray and lift it up before you and say, God, would you come? Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you today more than in or any time. Lord, in the times of our struggles, in the times of our weaknesses, we cry out to you, O oh God. So, Father, have your way today. Lord, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, we're going to have... Uh, Rick and Blanche are going to come and go through the uh, Advent with us this morning. Yep, it's on. On this third day to, of Advent, we remember the joy we have in Christ. Luke 2 8 to 14 and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you he is Christ the Lord this will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This candle is also known as the shepherd's candle. What joy those shepherds must have felt when they saw the Messiah with their own eyes. As we light this candle, we remember that Christ came to bring true and everlasting joy to all people. Well, good morning, everybody. So if you'll all stand with the, the boys here. This week, well, getting ready for this week's worship set list, all I could think of was that I wanted to sing about Jesus, sing to Jesus. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Thank you. 
Break every chain, break every chain. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so
entered this life, bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake Stone Lift it high forever. 
is alive. Oh, he is alive, Jesus. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Jesus is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. For Jesus is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah.
See what happens? Bang. Hooked on my shield. Well, let's begin. We're going to uh, be turning our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, we have been on this for the last couple weeks with the, with the names of this son that was to be given. And so we want to, again, just go there. And we want to read Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 1 to 7. Wow, I wonder what that is. You know, you think that, that all your electronics are working exactly, but it's not quite right. So this morning, uh, we are going to be talking about to the, con to the orphaned, he is everlasting father. Now, as I was preparing for this this morning, I just wanted to, I want to bring something that is so important and I think that is in our world today. And we look at what it means to be an orphan. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so, uh, what is the characteristics? We're going to talk about what are, what are the distinctions between a, a person who has an orphan spirit and a person who has, who understands their sonship in Christ. And when we talk about sonship, we're not talking about gender. It's just uh, we are God's children. And so often what I have found is that as Christians, one of the things is we accept and we understand Jesus as our Savior, but very few have allowed Jesus to be their father. And so within the church, there is a, what is called an orphan spirit. So we're going to be taking a look at that. But I want, if you want to take notes or whatever, do that. Because there's a lot of information that we're going to be going through. And so I just want to encourage you to do that. So uh, we have been going through again in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And in verse 6, we come to it. And so let's just read that together. Nevertheless... The gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light is dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, 
just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle will, and the blood-stained, bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you that you can speak to us even through these names. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give us ears to hear this morning. And Father, I pray that by your spirit that you would uh, enlighten the things in our hearts that we need to turn and we need to find you in. That Father, as your word has been read, I pray, God, that it would would awaken our spirit. And that, Father, this morning, as we again look at your word, that, Lord, that you would stir our hearts. Father, I pray for each one that is listening online, that, Father, that you would even now uh, draw their attention to what you want to say to them today. And that, Father, that they would be open to hear, willing to receive and willing to respond to your spirit today. Father, thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the last little while, we've been talking about the names of this son that is given, the one that is going to be given to us. 700 years before Jesus was born, this prophecy came. And when we understand, and we've sang it this morning about his death, about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that brought us into freedom. And that freedom is even better than we can ever imagine because we, we don't fully grasp what it means to be uh, in captivity. We don't quite grasp that thought. And yet the reality is, is before Christ, we were walking in darkness. We were walking uh, in a kingdom of darkness and we were being ruled by the things of this world. And yet because of Jesus, we are raised into newness of life. And so uh, this morning as we continue through, we look at these, these names and it is called the wonderful, he will be called the wonderful counselor. And two weeks ago, we started to talk about this whole area that to the uh, confused, he is wonderful counselor. To those who just don't know what's going on, they're trying to figure it out. Do you know that Jesus becomes the wonderful counselor? He shows us, he reveals to us by his Holy Spirit. He leads us into truth so that when the truth comes, we are set free. You see, he's the counselor. He doesn't leave us uh, on the sidelines, but he wants to reveal truth and take what is the Father and reveal it to us. And so I want to, again, just reiterate that to the confused, if you're not sure, then turn to Jesus. Call out to Jesus, and he will bring light to the, to the situation that you're facing this morning. To the confused, he is a wonderful counselor. And then we, last week, we talked about to the weak, he is mighty God. He is the mighty, mighty one. And then in our weaknesses, that's when his strength is made perfect. And again, we're talking eternal father, and next week, we are going to be dealing with the prince of peace. Again, these names really deal with the characteristic. It wasn't his specific name that they named Jesus, but it was the very characteristic of who he is and what he did and what he still does for us today. And so just like uh, I did in the last two weeks, I brought the Hebrew words, and again, if I mess up, and those of you who know Hebrew better than I do, that's okay, I can destroy any language. But... um, I want to just give you these, these words and what they meant, okay? So uh, he's the wonderful counselor. It's the, he, his name is Pala Ya'atz. And it means it's a cut above or better than anyone else could ever expect to be. It was to, he was to advise, to consult, and to give counsel, bringing purpose and help to devise a plan. You see, Jesus comes along as the wonderful counselor, 
the one above all the others. And he talked with them and he spoke with authority and with great power. And last week we talked about the mighty God, the El Gabor. And it meant, the Gabor means uh, the mighty or mighty. And El is that shortened version of Elohim, which meant the, the mighty one. And so when you brought those words together, it meant the mighty, mighty one. And we looked in 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 12, I believe it was, when we talked about when, when Paul went through all his struggles and all the issues that were going on, he, and he prayed to God, he says, deliver me from this. And God says what? He says, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. To the weak, he is the mighty, mighty one. And last week we ended with the fact that if you are feeling weak, then that's good because in our weakness, then God can become strong. In our weakness. And so this morning we want to talk about the everlasting Father. And it's the word everlasting Father is, an, and it's ad, ad, or, yeah, ad, of. And Av means father. So uh, they, what they do is they take the everlasting, the part that, that reveals who the father is, the, the ad, it means, some, it means everlasting or ancient. So it talks about the past. And then it also includes forever or the future time and the continuous existence forever. So God's existence, who was and is, and is to come. He is everlasting. He always has been. He is, and he will be. And then he brings in this one of Father, which is of, or you, it's spelled A-B, of, or the Father, the one who cares for and protects. Now, in our world today, there's actually no other, uh, no other word that brings so many different feelings. Because those who did not have a good father, the word father brings up these, these feelings and attitudes of, of, of um, discouragement and despair and hurt and pain. For others, the name father brings up, and, and I think of my own father, who walked alongside and he encouraged and helped. And I have a good uh, thought of who my father is, my earthly father. And for some who, who didn't have, uh, who, whose father or mother have passed away long before and they never knew their father or mother, the very pain that comes in that is here. And what, what I want to bring in is the fact that you're not left as an orphan but you have an everlasting Father. In our culture today, I'd say that fatherhood has been diluted to the point of near extinction. When we look at fatherhood around, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of men that can spawn a child, but that doesn't mean that they're fathers. There's a lot of fathers that are in the home and yet they're not present in the home when everything else is going on. They've, their mind and everything else is somewhere else. And they've left the, added the actions of what a father does to someone or something else. And what I found in so many of our, our, the youth even today, they get connected with peers and their peers become the one that their father should be. I had the privilege of meeting a gentleman just this week. And he often sits down, he's very blunt with his kids, but he talks with his kids and he says, you know, what do you think? And he, opened up, he opens up an avenue which they can talk. And I'm thinking, isn't that amazing in a day and age today that you can still have fathers who are willing to spend time and talk and to be present with their families. Most of the fathers don't even understand their role and have abdicated it. In the Bible times, when it talks about an orphan, an orphan was a person who was deprived of parents. Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 3, 
we, it says, we have become orphans and fatherless, our mothers like widows. And since the father was the main means of economy in the, in the Bible times, support for the family was really important. That was the father did. He supported and, and helped the family. His absence, left his, his absence left his wife and children in a particularly vulnerable condition. So when the father was missing, the wife and the children were left trying to fend in a world that didn't work. And you know it's still the same today. When, you're, when the father is missing out of the home, it leaves such a hole that God, God intended the father to do. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1 to 7 deals with this part and, and that the children are left in vulnerability. We're not going to read it. But consequently, in the Bible, in the Near East, orphans and widows usually are mentioned together as the epitome of the poor and deprived of society. When the father is missing, they are left in a state of depravity. To say that our generation is a generation of orphans would not be too far off. There's a sense of abandonment, loneliness, alienation, and isolation. And yet again, even within the church, there are many who still have a sense of being an orphan. And again, you can be a Christian and still walk in this sense, this, this, this feeling of being an orphan because again, you've allowed Jesus to be your Savior, but you have not allowed Him to be your Father. You have not allowed God to be your Father. And so you continuously strive to find that place of the Father in your life. Their identity, even within the church, is still being seen as orphans. How does this happen? How do we get to this place? And that's a lot of it is when troubles and struggles come in to our lives. And, and maybe when, when uh, the earthly father is gone, what ends up happening, we see our heavenly father in that same way as absent. And so we don't go to him and talk with him. We don't go to our heavenly father and seek his help. But we find that we have to try and work everything in our own strength. And so we walk with what it's called as an orphan spirit. And so in this next little bit, what I would like to do is I want to, and I'm not, I, these are not all on the screen. Is that? I didn't put all 11 on the screen so if you want to, uh, you can write them down. It's going to be really quick. Or you can, again, go back and watch through this later on because I think it has very, uh, it's very pertinent for us today. And, you know, we all face this, this sense of orphanness in different levels. Some, they're not there at all. Some are still way back, back on this side, and they're somewhere in the middle. So I'm going, to, I'm going to walk you through quickly these 11 things, and then I want to give you uh, five characteristics of what it is to have an everlasting father. So we've got a, a quick job ahead of us in the next 13 minutes and 30 seconds. So these 11 characteristics of an orphan spirit and a spirit of sonship. Number one, the orphan spirit operates out of insecurity and jealousy. They operate out of this place of insecurity. The spirit of sonship functions out of love and acceptance. The orphan spirit is jealous of the success of his brothers. They're envious. The mature son is committed to the success of his brothers. Number three, the orphan spirit serves God to earn the father's love. When we look at the, the world around us, we just, instead of just the, the orphan spirit, just that the, a person who feels like they're an orphan, they try and look for acceptance. 
They're looking for love. And I've often told you before, that's where I was. Looking for love. Willing to do whatever it took until Jesus came and he spoke to me. He says, I've accepted you as who you are. And you see, it changed everything. And so, so often I, get, I can find myself falling back and then I have to go back and realize and remember that God has accepted me. The mature son serves God out of a sense of divine acceptance and favor. Number four, the orphan spirit tries to medicate his deep internal alienation through physical stimulation. The mature son walks in the joy and presence of the Lord for comfort. Number five, the orphan spirit is driven by the need for success. The spirit leads the mature son into his calling and mission. If we're pushing, we're striving for success rather than resting in what, who God called us, and who, what our mission is. The orphan spirit uses people as objects to fulfill their goals. Mature sons serve people to bless the kingdom. Number seven, the orphan spirit repels their children. The spirit of sonship attracts their children. Number eight, the orphan spirit has issues with anger and fits of rage. The spirit of sonship rests in the father's ability to control and guide their future. Number nine, the orphan spirit is always in competition with others. The spirit of sonship is always blessing others. Number ten, the orphan spirit has a lack of self-esteem. The spirit of sonship walks in the love and acceptance of Father God. And the last one, number 11, the orphan spirit receives their primary identity through material possessions, their physical appearance, and activities. The spirit of sonship has their identity grounded in their sonship and their father's affirmation. Now, I, didn't, I, I looked this up. I, I wanted to see what is it about an orphan spirit. And, and if you want, you can, you can look it up on your own, and it'll be there. But I wanted to bring this to you because when we look at our own lives, can you see yourself in some of these places? And we need to come back to the place where we turn to Jesus. He says, this son will be given and his name will be called Everlasting Father. We are no longer orphans, but we have been brought into a family with God as our Heavenly Father. And understanding this place changes and brings freedom for each one who will listen. So when we consider the orphan, to the orphan, he is everlasting father. An everlasting father speaks of five things. Number one, it speaks of his everlasting presence. Now you can write these scriptures down. I'm not going to read them all just for the sake of time. But I wanted to, to focus on some of these, this everlasting presence. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 2, he says, I will be with you. I have called you by name. When you walk through the fire, when you walk through the river, when you walk through these things, I will be with you. That is a promise that God has made to those who he knows. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you, hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Even the right hand was his hand of power. He will hold on to you. Psalms 139 verses 7 to 10 he says, it, it starts off, where can I go to escape your spirit? If I go into the heavens or I go to the depths, you are there. And Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, 
Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. These words of this everlasting presence, dare I say, is so important for us today. The second one is this. The everlasting speaks of his everlasting provision. That God would provide. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33, it says this, don't, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you will wear. You know, we all worry about these things. But he goes on and he says this, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He is your everlasting Father. He is the one who provides. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. The very promises that we need to hang on to when we're feeling dis with great despair, we come back to this, that God provides. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 32 what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will, he not, how will he not also with him grant us everything? Provide it all. God is our everlasting Father. And we can enjoy his everlasting provision. The third one is his everlasting protection. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Psalms 18 verses 1 to 19 Again, I'm not reading that whole thing. But it says this, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I will be saved from my enemies. Have you ever felt the need when, when everything seems to come against you and we just talked about the armor but it all comes and we need to come back to recognize that God is our everlasting Father and His everlasting protection comes when we rest and when we trust in Him. The fourth one is His everlasting protection. Patience. We start in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Those words, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Those words, even when Job went and he wanted Nineveh to be destroyed, or not Job, but um, Jonah, when he wanted the Ninevites to be destroyed, he didn't want to go. He went the other way. And it says this at the end uh, of, of that, he says this, I knew, God, that you were slow to anger and that you would forgive. I knew it. That's why I didn't want to go, because I wanted them destroyed. God is patient. And you know what? I am so thankful that God is patient with us. When you've messed up, you think, God, you're done with me. I'm done. I'm finished. He's still patient, merciful. And we come back to that. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 it says again, or do not despise the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is 
is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness, his patience leads us to a place of repentance. Psalms 103, verses 18 to 14. 8, 8 to 14. And I'll read this. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserved or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. And then 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 to 16. We have his everlasting patience. When we come to our Father, Again, we're not the orphan, we're not here, but we have been brought in before God. And we can experience His patience. And the fifth one is this, His everlasting passion. He is passionate. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. He is passionate towards you. His great love. 1 John 4, 10 to 12. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, this is again, comes back to what we're talking about at Christmas time. For God so loved the world that He gave His passion, His great love for the world, for each one of us. John 13, verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. His great love carried him all the way through the cross, all the way through the torture, all the way through it, to be nailed on the cross. And he says, could I not have called my father and he would have sent a legion of angels to set me free? But he held on and he, was not, he did not come down. You see, it was because of his great love for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrated his love for us in, that, in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, Romans 8. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, he says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp though how wide and long, high and deep the love of Christ is, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. We can know his everlasting passion. Now you see, we went through that really quickly. You know what, I actually, I made it through in less than 13 minutes. But I want you to remember, and and we're going to just quickly take a look again, and and I'm not going to go through the 11, but you see, we can carry a spirit of an orphan as Christians because we don't recognize who God is and what God has done. And yet God wants us to walk in freedom and to understand and to know his goodness towards us. Many people struggle with this orphan spirit, especially when things start going south on them. When things start working the way they think, the when, when, we're, when we're given in this, this uh, direction that we have to wear these masks all the time indoors or when, when they tell us you have to do this, you have, then we start to feel like we're, we, we're getting a, and we start to fight our way through things instead of recognizing who we are in Christ. It becomes so easy to forget 
whose we are, and we start to look at ourselves as I have to do this on my own. Many struggle because they don't know God as their Heavenly Father. And if they do know God as Savior, they've not experienced Him. And in the church, many have not experienced Him as their heavenly, everlasting Father. Jesus came to show us the Father through His death, life, and re- or His life, death, and resurrection. He made a way so that every person could experience who He is, not just a wonderful counselor, not just a mighty God, but an everlasting Father. We experience His everlasting presence, His everlasting provision, His everlasting protection, His everlasting patience, and His everlasting passion when we walk and we allow Christ to speak into our lives. We receive the truth and allow that truth to set us free. And we experience an understanding of Jesus as the everlasting Father by, the, by and through the Holy Spirit who brings revelation of the truth. You see, we can't fully grasp it without God explaining and showing it to us. And he does that when he allows, when, when we open our hearts and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak and to reveal truth and reveal it bring, and bring us through this. You see, we can't even understand what Scripture says without the Holy Spirit. And my question or my call to you today is to allow the Holy Spirit to bring revelation of who you are in the midst of your struggle in the midst of feeling as an orphan, feeling without protection, without that help. But God stands as the one who is your everlasting Father. You can experience His presence. You can experience His provision and His passion, and His protection and His patience. John chapter 16 Verses 12 to 15 talks about the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. And he'll take what is the Father's and declare it to you. These truths are what's going to set you free. So if you don't know Jesus as the everlasting Father, if you've never experienced, and this mostly because I know you and Each one of you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, but those online, if you've never experienced Jesus as, first of all, your Savior, you won't know him as your Father. And so I'd invite you to turn and just to ask the Lord to come and forgive you of your sin and turn your heart to him and say, God, come, forgive me and be my Savior. And it's not just about praying a prayer. And, and, and you all know that it's not just pray, don't just pray a prayer, but it's that turning of your heart completely to the Lord and to walk after Him and, not, and, and to pray and to seek Him and to spend time with Him, build that relationship because the Father, the Heavenly Father, wants to have that living relationship. But as a Christian, are you struggling with an orphan spirit? And you want to experience Jesus as your your heavenly Father, as your everlasting Father, but you're struggling and you're not quite sure and you're hurting and you want to be set free. Can I tell you this? Take those scriptures and reread them. Say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, reveal to me. Holy Spirit, help me to understand, for I cannot do it on my own. I need your help. And as you would turn to and ask the Holy Spirit to work and to reveal it, He will. And you can be set free from this orphan spirit. As we come to a close this morning, I want to take, I I want to pray a, a prayer that is in the scriptures. It's out of Ephesians chapter one. And instead of turning to it, I'm just going to pray it. So if you just bow your heads and let's pray. I pray, 
Father, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you might know the hope of his calling the wealth of his glorious inheritance in you, his saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the mighty working of his strength. Father, I pray that each one, whether here or online, Lord, that they would cry out to you and that, Father, that you would give them that spirit Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Revelation of who you are and who they are in Christ. That they might walk free of this spirit of, uh, of an orphaned spirit. That they would walk free and they would experience the fullness of who you are, Lord. As their heavenly Father, their everlasting Father, who was and is and still is to come, that you would reveal that to them and that they can walk no longer in bondage, but free as you've made them through the blood of Jesus. Father, today I pray for Hank and Don and the Calvin and Edie and the family. I ask you, Lord, that your peace would come upon them today. That they would know your presence. That they would know your your love, your passion in a new way today. That nothing separates them from your love. Lord, surround them today. And as they come together tomorrow for the memorial, I pray that they might know you. And for the family of Rudy, that they too, Lord, would experience the everlasting Father. God, thank you for your goodness. And we commit our ways to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. As we end this morning, I just want to just say, if you here need prayer, or if you want to talk about some of these things that we've been talking about, you here or online. If you're online and you want to get a hold of me, you can uh, get, go through the Facebook page or you can get a hold of me on my cell phone. It's also on there too. Uh, and I would really encourage you that if you're struggling and you're dealing with this orphanness, this feeling of as an orphan, and Jesus wants you to know that he is your everlasting father. God does this so that you could walk in freedom. I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. We're going to sing one more song. And uh, as we do, let's just continue to lift our eyes towards heaven. Let you guys know. And <clears throat> we're, uh, this is kind of like an old spiritual, is what it was listed as. <coughs> so there will be guys that can sing with Mickey and Ian, and they're basically going to be singing Amen. That's all they have to do. And then there is another part that has words, and if you want to follow, you can sing those, then you can sing with me.
have a good week guys